break it down to the tiny few that have left. Lord, we ask that you would astonish us today with your word. Holy Spirit is only you can do. And we thank you, God, that your word is alive and true and relevant today. And so much more than, than even mere words can explain. Thank you, God, for who you are. And help us to learn more of that even this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to be in the book of James. And we are on chapter 3. I realize that I'm going through this fairly quickly, and if I was smart about this, I could get whew, months of sermons out of this, maybe years. <laughs> Just this one book. But it's, I, I feel at, at this time, that it's necessary to go through God's Word, and, well, I can't quite explain it myself. But he's brought us to the book of James, and we're in chapter 3 today, and, and James, it, it, chapter 3 is basically in two parts. First section is on controlling the tongue. Second section is on true wisdom, is that true wisdom comes from God. And I believe that those two things kind of go hand in hand. So we can combine that all into one today. Save time, right? Isn't that what we're all about? Saving time? We shouldn't be, right? A recap from last week is James 2, 26. Last verse of James 2. It says, Just as the body is dead without a spirit, so also faith is dead without good deeds. And then we begin in chapter 3, verse 1. And I was tempted to leave this one out, but it's highlighted. I've highlighted it in my Bible, so I feel that it's important to share it with you. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged by God with greater strictness. Now there's probably somebody out there that's going, see, there, I'm out. Right? We don't go looking for that sort of thing, but we shouldn't shy away from it either. Once God calls you to something, he equips you. Now believe me, I've spent more than a few moments dwelling on that verse. At times I, well, that's just not fair, but it is. It's, 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 it is fair and it's just and it's right. Now, I don't consider myself to be special. I don't, I don't, and this may go against the grain, but as your pastor, I don't consider myself in authority over you because I'm not. I'm only a shepherd. I'm only here to teach little pieces now and then. I'm only here to share with you what God would have me share with you. But there are many of you many of us that are called to be teachers. Now it's true, God can do it without us. But I really believe that he needs us to step up to the plate. I wasn't even going to dwell on this verse. In fact, I was just going right on by it. I hope you didn't notice. Not really. When the Bible says, when God says that he, if he, those who teach will be judged with greater strictness. In our human understanding, we instantly think of that and look at that and we go, mm -mm, no, I don't want that. That's going to be even worse. But see, with God, so many things are the opposite of the way that we see them. We see with a combination of our flesh and our spirit. And that's why things are crooked and kind of wavy and kind of cloudy at times, because we're looking through two different lenses. Anybody ever try that? You grab one of your spouses, you know, their glasses, one up this way and one up this way. See how that works. You run into things more than you do normally. That's why we need God's word as a roadmap, if you will. 
So let's go on. But let me just finish with this. God's strictness is nothing to shy away from. In fact, I believe we could substitute that word with blessing. With blessing. Verse 2. And we all make many mistakes, but those who control their tongues can also control themselves in every other way. We can make a large horse turn around and go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. Does anybody recognize this from a children's moment just a few weeks ago? That was the week that I started on James and I didn't know what she was gonna do. So I thought it was kind of a little cool little thing. And a tiny rudder, verse four, makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot wants it to go, even though the winds are strong. So also the tongue is a small thing, but what enormous damage it can do. A tiny spark can set a great forest on fire, and the tongue is a flame of fire. It is full of wickedness that can ruin your whole life. It can turn the entire course of your life into a blazing flame of destruction, for it is set on fire by hell itself. Oh my goodness. You know what I take from this? This is a big deal. This is a big deal. How many of you know that you can tear a person to shreds just with your words? You never have to swing a fist or kick or throw something or shoot at them. Just your words and will do as much or more damage than any physical pain you could inflict. How many of you have experienced that kind of tear down? How many of you have delivered that kind of attack? Now, you, you, you don't, don't go think, well, I haven't done that bad. The Bible says if we hate a person, it's, it's equal to murder. If we look at someone else with lust in our eye, it's akin to adultery. It's the same thing. So let's not start evaluating and putting things in can. Well, okay, I'm, well. And I'm gonna go, I'm gonna get into that just a little bit in just a minute here. So let's go on. Verse seven. People can tame all kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and fish. Fish? Okay. All right. Bible says so. It can be done. But no one can tame the tongue. Do you believe that today? How about you? I know I need the Holy Spirit in me to tame my tongue. Anybody else with me on that one? Mm hmm And if it's that important that, that if I don't, and, and, and we all know what it's like when garbage or, or filth or vulgarity or, or uh, anger and wrath comes out of our mouth. It's like a poison coming out, isn't it? You, you know it when it's happening. It's like, oh, this is making me sick to my own stomach. Right? Anybody else ever been there? Let's be honest with each other because we're in church and if we're not going to be real and be honest, well, there ain't no sense sitting here right now, is there? Wow, boy. If I'd have ever said ain't, in fact, I tried it once in the presence of my grandmother and I never did it again. Hmm. It says something about the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> All right. Listen to this, verse 9. Sometimes again with our tongue, with our mouth. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it breaks out into curses against those who have been made in the image of God. If you want to begin to see people the way that God sees us, ask him that. And then think about that, that statement right there that person you're tearing down is someone else that God made in his own image. Now God isn't, you know, telling us we can't have disagreements or we can't, it's just, we 
need to learn to control our tongue. And more, more, moreover, we need to ask for God to help us. Verse 10, and so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Can you pick olives from a fig tree or figs from a grapevine? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty pool. If you are wise and understand God's ways, live a life of steady goodness so that only good deeds will pour forth. And if you don't brag about the good you do, then you will be truly wise. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your hearts, don't brag about being wise. That is the worst kind of lie. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and motivated by the devil. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every kind of evil. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and good deeds. It shows no partiality and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of goodness. How many farmers or, or, or you, you have a farm background can, can understand that when you plant a seed, you reap a harvest? And what we're talking about here, what God is saying, and those who are peacemakers will plant the seeds of peace and reap a harvest of goodness. Is that possible in our world today, in the year 2021? All things are possible through Christ. With God, all things are possible. Speak right up. Just yell it right out. Be bold. Be bold in your faith. Now we're going to go right into communion. And... I, uh, for those of you at home who would like to take communion this morning and get your uh, get your, your your bread and your your juice or your drink ready coffee donut whatever you have it's about what's in our heart I want to ask you about something. Everyone listening to me right now, I want to ask you something. What draws you to the Lord? Is it not the Lord himself? The Bible says that the Holy Spirit draws us to God. Jesus came and he fulfilled prophecy. See, without the Old Testament, we can't have the New Testament. In that fulfilling of prophecy, he died a physical death. The Son of God, God came to earth as man, put skin on, came down here, and endured every temptation that we endure. He died on the cross. He was resurrected, which means he rose to life unbelievably on the third day. I say unbelievably because in my flesh, I can't believe that, but in my spirit, I know it's true. And you know what? 
there comes a point where the spirit begins to overpower the flesh. And now my flesh says I knew it all along, but I'm finally willing to admit it. You see, Jesus came to bring a new covenant between us and God. To set that separation that was between us and God, Jesus came to bridge that gap. In fact, he didn't just come to do it, he came and he did it. And then just like Adam and Eve in the garden, we have a choice to make. Will we accept that? Do we want to be astonished today? Do we really embrace every aspect of God's will in our lives? Now, I know many of us here do, but there's, there's someone maybe here, maybe, and I'm not trying to get fancy about this. We've all been there. Who's looking for something, and maybe we don't even know what it is we're looking for. Well, I want to say this today, and I'm not one to candy coat things. Sometimes I stop a little shorter than I should because I don't want to hurt someone. Or make somebody feel uncomfortable. So I want to say this today. First of all, there is a real heaven and there is a real hell. There is sin and there are consequences of it. And the consequences affect the wages of sin, as the Bible says, is death. What you get for sin, what you get paid in return, what you receive for your time and your effort is death. But you see, I don't think we need to convince the rest of the world of their sin. As a church, we need to be that bridge to God. I want you to just think about something for a minute, church. And I can't, I can only share it in my own terms. When I came to the Lord, when I received salvation, when I accepted Christ as my Savior, I felt much less. And maybe this isn't the way it's supposed to be. But I felt much less guilt and shame on that day than I do today when I think about my sin. You see, I don't need someone to point it out to me. What I need and what someone without Christ needs is to be pointed to Christ. The good news, the good news that Jesus came as the Messiah to pay the price for you and I. There's a whole world out there that's lost in sin. And I'm not saying we shy from the truth, but what I am saying, offer the alternative. Don't dwell on someone's past. Don't just point out that you're not good enough. You see, Jesus believes that you are. Do you remember when he chose the disciples? He just picked them. And... Matthew went from being a tax collector. Peter went from being a fisherman. I don't believe he stood there and lectured them on their sins. He said, come, follow me. You see, when you come and you follow Jesus and you receive him into your heart and the Holy Spirit begins to abide in you, God begins to work on all those things. All those things that nobody else could fix in you. All those things that you couldn't even fix yourself. He begins to work on those. And he does it in a way that we cannot do. He doesn't tear us down, but he builds us up. That is not diminishing the importance of, your, thank you, of what Jesus did. <laughs>
Because the whole thing that he did on that cross was to defeat the power of sin in our lives. Now that's why the church world is tuning in on Facebook or wherever. That's why the church finds this so important. Because it is. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior today, it doesn't make you better than someone who hasn't. Makes you forgiven. Gives you redemption. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And Lord, we thank you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing it together. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and you, sealed by the shedding of my blood. Do this in remembrance of me, as often as you drink it. Now you think about this for just one moment. This little cup by itself is absolutely nothing. But what it symbolizes is everything. The shedding of Christ's blood for you and I for this entire world, for a world that wasn't even ready to receive. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Lord, we thank you. 